morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here. Congratulations to the CSF Foundation, to uh, Dorothy for uh, having the foresight to organize us, to the neurosurgery department for uh, making this all possible for us, and of course to Petra Klinger for having the, the uh, vision to pull this group together and to uh, work together with me, and Petra's done most of the work here, to be honest, uh, to find the, uh, the conference speakers, the topics, and it's my, my great privilege to be part of this. Of course, I feel a bit of like a fish out of water as a neurologist in the neurosurgery group, but I hope that we'll change that with time because patients do present to the neurologist to try and understand some of the unusual symptoms that they have. So what we're going to do also here is I'm going to start with a uh, uh, story from uh, some of my just two patients who got my attention. So I'll give you just a... a quick background on, on my own story is I'm a neurologist, a behavioral neurologist, a neuroanatomist. Uh, I've had an interest in cerebellum and cerebellar cognition for many years. And uh, uh, as a resident in neurology, came to the idea that there's something about cerebellum that goes beyond motor control, but I'll come to that. What got my attention uh, in Chiari was uh, two, one patient initially a year ago and a second just recently uh, that I'd like to tell you about. So the first setup in the introduction is to follow on from the, uh, the, the critical piece of doctoring that uh, Dr. Klinger referred to, which is uh, listening to the patient. And we've heard so eloquently that the doctors just don't listen. And I think that doctors don't listen because there is no fertile ground upon which the seed of a new direction that the patient is informing them about can fall upon. In the absence of an understanding of a disorder, when the physician hears a symptom complex, they're not going to know what to do with it. And this becomes our mandate in education, which is to increase the knowledge and the awareness of where we're going with brain science and how that uh, meets with clinical neurology. The rubber meets the road with the science and the clinical intervention and the clinical interaction. So I'll tell you about a fellow who's uh, about 18 years of age now, um, who from the age of about eight uh, was given medications for what was thought to be attention deficit disorder. Uh, these apparently were not very successful, although he managed to get by and in fact was academically uh, quite gifted comes from a family of high achievers and went to good schools and, and did, did well. Uh, he had a concussion that may or may not have been relevant. This, this is something we can come back to. Uh, on, the, on the sports field at age 15, had a bit of wooziness and imbalance. And around that time, whether rela directly related or not is difficult to be sure, he began to develop a constellation of psychiatric symptomatology and school academic failure. The symptoms included rumination, obsessing over things, a great degree of anxiety. Uh, his parents found him to be emotionally off, uh, racing thoughts. Uh, he was truly depressed. He lost interest in things that were of great, uh, previously great interest to him. He became angry and hostile. He couldn't focus well. Uh, he was irritable, reclusive, and he found himself stuck in a loop of thinking. Um, he began processing conversations poorly, not doing well with understanding what was being said to him, with complex logical reasoning, and his social skills began to deteriorate. Now, in the middle of uh, 2015, the summer of 15, uh, he starts to become worse. The profanities, which was unusual for him, the frustration and the meanness. He starts gambling. He's forgetful. He's absent-minded. Intention is impaired. Working memory is troublesome. And his school uh, work literally starts to fall off the rails. He, he just uh, doesn't do well. At this time, he's seeing psychiatrists for this behavior, but a psychiatrist recognizes that it's unusual he's having headaches as well and requires that he get an MRI. And the MRI shows a Chiari malformation uh, with a syrinx. And this was his scan, where you see a prominent, about 17, 18 millimeter Chiari uh, bel um, malformation below the uh, foramen magnum. And he has a, a syrinx as well. Now, that's in the, in the summer of 15. And as you know, Chiari malformation causes valsalva-induced headache and tingling in the hands and maybe some gait failure, period, with a few other bits and pieces. And if, you've, if you're outside of that mold, there's nowhere to put you. And so 
life went on, continued with school, but by the uh, winter end of, by the end of the uh, semester starts in January of 16, he literally starts to be unable to do his schoolwork and gets suspended because of a joking threat to another student. The psychiatrists again uh, find him to be compulsive, obsessive, uh, manic, ruminative, and the second psychiatrist sees him, sees the scans, and then sends me an email saying, I wonder, given this fellow's symptoms and his MRI, does he have your syndrome, which we'll talk about later? Does he have the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome? Are these two related? Is the Chiari somehow related to this constellation? Uh, we get an MRI again, which shows uh, that he has the, the same uh, Chiari uh, um, uh, de uh, malformation with the depression of the tonsils below the foramen magnum. And there's a question of a slightly enlarged syrinx. So frankly, at this point in time, the conversation is going backwards and forwards. And I'm saying, I don't know. Uh, this is not an experimental animal. You can't just go do stuff. You can uh, think up something and say, well, this is the reason. So what we did was we found, to be honest, as my father-in-law would say, there is a real reason and, the, and the, good re the good reason and the real reason. The good reason to operate was the syrinx looked like it was getting slightly larger. So we had a, a bona fide reason to go in there. That was the good reason. The real reason was we suspected this was related to his whole essential slide into what was being thought of as schizophrenia. So the school failure and neuropsychiatric phenomenology. So he has the decompression surgery in March of 2016. And a month later, less than that, he reports that he starts to feel for the first time in years that he's getting back to normal health. He's not double or triple thinking. Every day he's feeling better, he's more like he used to be, he's functioning normally, he's listening properly, he's interacting well. His capacity to process information and, and conversations is improved. He's more interested in doing things he'd like. He's feeling joy again. His mood is improved. No anxiety. He writes a paper for school on Macbeth in a couple of days. It would have taken him weeks before that. His walking feels like it's a bit better. He felt he used to drag his feet before, only occasional headaches. And then uh, at the end of that month, he's feeling almost back to himself. His parents feel he's back to basically 85, 90% of himself. Feels completely different, back to life finds it's scary to think about those three years that he was having all those troubles. And uh, just a, a month ago when I spoke to his father, he's back at school. Grades aren't perhaps what they, what they used to be before, but his IQ is 148. He's a very gifted young man, doing well. Uh, trouble with discipline perhaps and focusing and some spatial issues. I wasn't, wasn't sure what he meant by that, but nothing psychiatric. So this for me was a wake-up call because this is a surgical intervention performed by the surgeons in New York that essentially cured uh, dementia and schizophrenia. So if you take all those symptoms I just gave you, uh, dementia described as a loss of previously acquired skills, he had school failure, there are kids who have, you know, Neiman Pick or, or the, the variety of, you know, Crabbe's, the disease that kids get that can wipe out cognition and cause true dementia. The school failure is part of that constellation and the neurobehavioral constellation, all those psychiatric phenomena <coughs> could fit into either a obsessive compulsive disorder, a schizophrenic form psychosis, and so on. So I'm gonna come back to him <coughs> in the afternoon talk with some data, but I wanted to tell you that story and then tell you about the next case as well. Now this is a youngster, also 17, uh, who we studied just recently, and this is in collaboration with uh, Bill Butler, the um, uh, pediatric neurosurgeon at Mass General, and Bess Shannon, who's uh, 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 a nurse practitioner who's been closely involved, and my postdoc fellow uh, Xavier Guell has worked with him also uh, to do uh, a new imaging, and I'll tell you about the story. This is a youngster, so here's the Chiari. It's a, it's a whopping Chiari malformation, no syrinx, uh, very tight around the uh, foramen magnum, really actually distorting this in the top of his cord. So his story uh, goes back to early on, where there was developmental delay. And I'll give you my formulation as I presented it to the family uh, in terms of how we manage this uh, in, when, I, when I presented the case. Developmental delay, speech, uh, sensory motor problems, executive function, expressive more than receptive troubles, uh, impairment of thinking, working memory, and then testing showed a borderline intellect, autism spectrum, and a mild intellectual disability. He did have some strengths though. He, he actually loved cooking. He was great in the kitchen. <clears throat> Athletically, 
he enjoyed playing sport. He would. Uh, he was involved actually in uh, Special Olympics and played uh, because of the disability intellectually uh, in Special Olympics. And he played uh, baseball. He had an upbeat disposition. He was cooperative. He had good, re good logical reasoning. Um, and that's how life progressed. He he had a, a, a hit and a fall, probably a concussion, uh, during hockey in February of '16. Again, whether this is related or not is difficult to know. But around the 2015-16 academic year, he starts to have school failure. And then he develops uh, episodes. Now, the mom last night sent me a series of videos, which I'm not going to show you. They're actually quite upsetting. Uh, they show all of this. Intense seizure-like episodes, involuntary movements, uh, confusion, uh, uncharacteristic behaviors collecting in clusters. Uh, his processing and general functioning level was, was quite impaired. Uh, he lost interest in things he used to enjoy. And car rides would almost reliably trigger these unusual, what they called sensory episodes. So the motion in the car would produce a, a, a constellation I'll come to. The mother then writes to me, and I've, I've just pasted the capitals in her email, from the winter of 1617, communication is shut down, he has heightened anxiety, he has tics with OCD and autism type behaviors, intrusive thoughts, ritualistic behaviors, religiosity and insomnia. He has sensory overload and vestibular discomfort. He goes into trance-like states, seemingly unaware of where he is and who we are. So the videos show him um, pacing up and down in an obsessive kind of a manner, turning and backwards and forwards, or lying on the ground groaning or shaking his head, um, or staring ahead of him, uh, shaking and moaning, uh, very upsetting. And then he has episodes prompted by laughing, turning into coughing spasms, but his whole body shakes. And these car rides would make him very distressed, hunching up his shoulders, squinting his eyes, a sense of being hyperattentive gurgling sounds and tongue thrusting. In June of last year, uh, he reported his head is, is hurting at the occipital region. He puts his hands there to show this radiation of pain to the vertex and tries to stretch his lower backs. And these OCD type behaviors with snapping fingers and sniffing and, pr and purposeless finger movements. This is for all intents and purposes, uh, autistic kind of behaviors uh, in childhood. He had vestibular physical therapy, which made him go quote off the wall. Uh, with confusion, body movements, and bizarre behaviors, opening all the windows, avoiding eye contact, talking to himself, responding to internal stimuli, and then laughing inappropriately. In January of this year, he went to a, a hockey game and was chuckling to himself out loud for three hours with body shaking and, and, and snorting, and then was ended with a coughing spell. Uh, eyes uh, squinting, shaking, and so it goes, agitation, irritation, can go on for hours. And then in April, just a little while ago, he took a turn for even worse. Uh, the symptoms became dramatically worse. Uh, he was able to go to school, but the, each, each afternoon he had these episodes of confusion, impaired movement, and active tremors, and waves of laughter with panting and facial expressions of anguish, with the eyes staring and looking frozen in front of him, posture uh, all hunched up. He couldn't describe what he was feeling, but he would be making these uh, unusual noises and holding his head. And then on May 4th, he had an episode of self-injury with a superficial stab wound. At this point in time, we had already planned for him to come up to Boston. I'd seen him to come up to Boston and have the Chiari surgery with, with uh, uh, Bill Butler. Um, there was, we wanted a time for school, but this all crashed. Uh, so he has a self-injury, he's on suicide watch, he's gone into the psychiatric emergency room a few times uh, with his coughing and gagging fits provo provoking panic and this non-responsive state and the psychiatrist diagnosed catatonia. So rather, we basically met flight him up to Boston, and on May 8th, he has a decompression surgery. And this is just uh, last month. So on June 5th, at the time of surgery, <coughs> and, and Bill was gracious enough to invite me into the operating room, a very tight uh, fit over the uh, descender tonsils of the cerebellum. And, and Bill can describe this when he talks later, but at the, at the incision of the, of the dura, this thing pops out, and just a dramatic difference before and after as you now start to see the pulsation. So June 5th, his demeanor is now reserved, but he's present. He's enjoying being around the extended family. He's not complained of pain, no further episodes of tremors. His range of emotions is expanding. He's smiling and laughing more. He's pensive, but he's not really crying about his grandfather's recent death, but he's still there. Good flexibility. Tolerating air travel, tolerating car travel. And he has a picture, a picture of him hanging out with his family. Very different than he had been for the previous year. And then June 7th, this is just a week ago. It's apparent, the mom said, the decompression of the brainstem of cerebellum and medulla and restoration of CSF flow 
has eliminated the seizure-like tremoring and other acute neurologic havoc that escalated to a dangerous neuropsychiatric state when left unaddressed or otherwise mistreated for 11 months. And this is him with the family on the shore when they got together after the father's death. Uh, and there is there's no way that this child, this young man, would be doing this uh, prior to his surgery. I'll show you data in the, in the lecture this afternoon. But I think what this, what this tells me is that there is an avenue here for us to explore. The, these symptoms are nowhere in any textbook that I know of as a manifestation of Chiari malformation. These symptoms of neuropsychiatric phenomenology are nowhere in any textbook of cerebellar disorders. They exist in our papers on the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome and the neuropsychiatry of cerebellum, but almost as anecdotes, and well, that's sort of interesting, and let's look at that. But I think what this tells us is that there is an opportunity for us to explore this. Is this real? Is it true? How widespread is it? Um, and, and how much of a, of a phenomenology here do we really have that we need to explore? So I think that we're, at the, we're at the beginnings of a new stage of a new field of the neuropsychiatry of cerebellum. <coughs> Whether this is a CSF dynamic flow problem or otherwise, I think it's very difficult to know at this point. But the fact that we have these cases, and I know I've heard from Dr. Anderson that they are that the cases that uh, he's seen himself, that we talk that ref that describe a phenomenon of autistic-like behaviors that then respond to Chiari decompression. What I said to the family on the second case was, we'll do the surgery, but here's a, here are three different possibilities of what this is about. One is that the Chiari is completely irrelevant, and we'll do the surgery and nothing changes. So going into this, you should know that's a possibility. The second is that there's some kind of underlying developmental disorder or gene thing. He had exome sequencing with some variants, but nothing specific. There's some underlying problem upon which Chiari is superimposed that has produced these decompensations, and then we can get him back to what he was prior to surgery. And the third most radical idea is that the Chiari explains everything, um, but, but we don't know that. So we uh, brought him in before the surgery, and we did uh, functional MRI, and Xavier, my student, uh, is, is doing this with uh, the MIT group with John Gabriani. So we have pre-surgery pre data and we'll be scanning him again in a month or two to see how this changes, if at all, to try and get a better understanding of the mechanisms, the pathophysiology of what we hope would be an improvement, which we now have seen clinically, and so we hope to understand this better at the level of, of mechanism and phenomenology. So that's what I want to leave us with uh, at this at this point, uh, um, and we can uh, maybe take questions either of, of a family, or we can just have a few minutes to discuss this at this point before moving on to the next the next part of our morning. Yes. and um, trying to figure out which one comes first is quite interesting. Have you noticed any of that? So this is the pediatric autoimmune disorder associated with streptococcus, pandas. So um, I don't see much of that. Um, I think it's also uh, debated. So here's where we had a, a, a I remember Dr. Rick, uh, Hal Riketa had a nice reaction to my discussion a year ago at the CSF talking about normal pressure hydrocephalus as not being a belief system. Uh, that there are data, and, and uh, Dr. Klinger also has a, a strong feeling about this. These are diagnoses that you make. These are not beliefs about what patients have. Uh, so normal pressure hydrocephalus is a prime example of that. I think that the pandas is a similar story. I know that it's controversial in pediatric literature, but there are kids who have um, infections and then develop the syndrome and there are those who then, when treated with immune modulation, <laughs> improve. And that becomes, again, a matter of uh, a clinical scenario that needs to be studied in a careful, prospective, rigorous, scientific manner. Uh, I, I uh, strongly believe that science is not a belief system. Science is data-driven, and if the ideas are supported by the data, continue going. If they're not supported by the data, you don't. 
So from that perspective, um, I don't know what the relationship between pandas and Chiari is. Maybe they coexist, maybe they're true, true and unrelated. Uh, but that will be obviously a, a separate question that needs to be investigated by those who who seen the kids who have these problems and come up with a, a vigorous, um, scientifically accurate, carefully performed study to determine, even almost on a case-by-case -case basis, whether there is such a thing. Uh, one of my own uh, influences and mentors, uh, Marty Samuels, uh, likes to make fun of evidence-based medicine. Sometimes evidence-based medicine isn't so evidence-based. And then you get stuck into a, uh, a crystallized view of how things should be and it isn't necessarily the case. And so maybe there are people who have pandas that truly respond to immune modulation and the disease is real, but maybe folks who don't. I think these are larger conversations that, that need to be had within a vigorous, vigorous and rigorous uh, academic environment. See. Jeremy, it's wonderful, two uh, very thought-provoking -prov cases that you presented. Uh, between the first and the second case, if you look at the imaging studies, uh, uh, first patient has uh, significant syrinx associated with the KI, where the second patient really mainly has a compressive syndrome at the cervical medullary junction. How, uh, and you also briefly mentioned that maybe this, the uh, CSF circulation uh, compromise maybe is responsible for these symptoms. Is there a way to dissect that out? Because you can make that argument maybe for the first case, even for the second, although the patient does not have a syrinx. How is it? Uh, that you're going to be able to differentiate that this is really a, a truly a, a, a cerebellar abnormality that may be related to mechanical compression versus uh, the more of a global CSF circulation disturbance? I think that's a pivotal question. I, um, the way that we're going to start looking at that from our perspective, and I'd love to hear others' views and thoughts about this, uh, is to try and understand the effect of, these, of, the, uh, of the Chiari on the resting state networks in the cerebral hemispheres. So I'll talk about that when I, when I give my talk in a moment, uh, how, how those are interacted, interacting and interrelated. But I think if there is a focality to the abnormalities and a focality in a predictive way, predictable way to the response in recovery, that would suggest more that it's a um, cerebellar-based pathology, mechanical distortion, uh, pressure and necrosis of the affected areas as opposed to a more widespread uh, pathology. Uh, perhaps, you know, as we start to look more carefully at diseases that are clearly CSF based, like normal pressure hydrocephalus, uh, to try and compare and contrast, perhaps that will be a way for us to understand how the nervous system recovers and what, in retrospect, was the underlying pathophysiology. I think imaging will, will help us to get there. Yes, ma'am. Um, you had mentioned uh, for both of these patients that they had a uh, concussion and then subsequently their symptoms had gotten worse, although you don't know if the concussion had anything to do with that. Is there any uh, work being done or studies being done to look into whether concussion has a severe effect on patients with PRE? So I don't know the answer to that. Maybe, maybe Phil or others have, have, a, an understand, have, have some knowledge of that. The reason I think it could, it's interesting is because if there's, there's a, this is mechanical neurology, and it's a fascinating concept. Uh, almost like the, the sagging brain syndrome, the, the uh, CSF hypotension, where you get this frontotemporal dementia presentation of the, of the sagging brain syndrome, extraordinary. It's a mechanical distortion. You put the folks in Trendelenburg and they actually get better than the behavior improves. Although well, you can't live in Trendelenburg, so it's a problem if you can't find the leak to stop it. So I think there's something about the mechanical injury that is relevant perhaps in sparking off a decompensation. That's how I would put that together, but that's, that's totally hand wavy. I don't know the answer. Thank you. Fraser, you had a? Oh, I was going to ask you one question. A number of those symptoms uh, had characteristics of paraneoplastic lymphic encephalopathy and other sort of uh, inflammatory disorders. And I was wondering if if you've done any CSF studies and uh, the, the notion that, that Chiari had been there probably for many, many years. So uh, what was the series of uh, events that actually triggered those psychological changes? The, the Chiari provided a proclivity, but then there was some, some other trigger as well. And uh, you know, clearly you're saying that trauma, you know, maybe the subarachnoid hemorrhage and the concussion, increased CSF pressure, but were, were the other cytochemical things that may have uh, prompted the, 
those other changes? I think that's a really important question, and, and, and uh, thanks for focusing on that. I don't think that there's necessarily a subarachnoid hemorrhage, but I think if you if you look at the, uh, and the surgeons know this you know, better than I, the, in subdurals and the, the intracranial masses, that pressure volume curve, uh, as, the, as the volume of the intracranial contents increases, or the pressure increases, you know, doesn't increase, and then it goes up exponentially. I would imagine, and again, this is a guess, and the surgeons here can, can, can be more accurate about this, that with the tightness that you have, your, the wiggle room is basically gone. And so a little bit of something, whatever that something would be, and that is obviously an issue we'd like to solve, can really push this over the edge. That, that's how I would think about this. Rather than a metabolic change, uh, there's something about the change in the, in, in the, phys in, in the physical nature of this pathology that then sparks it off because you've lost the decompensation. But I would, I would wonder, so if I take the first part of the question, they're fine until this point. Is that really correct? Were they always fine? And so the kind of learning disability or the attention deficit or other things that were going on, was that somehow related to this? It's like the kids that the surgeons will operate on who had tumors, who may have developed some trouble with school failure two or three years before they present with the obstructive hydrocephalus from the metulobloster. That, that's a correct statement, right? I mean, you, you, that's a real, so, so there may be something, but there's, there's, a, there's a beginning of a tail here uh, that I think we should pay attention to. Just, just to just take the first part of your question and, and put that as a question. Is, is it in fact a statement that they're fine until, or is there something grumbling that then crashes? I just want to add one thing because we, that adds to what we just discussed. Um, whether, you know, I mean, we keep asking whether concussion or some new diseases have anything to do with the Chiari. And um, I mean, we, we keep asking the, the, the same question again and again, and these things come up. So there must be something to it, right? Uh, it's not that people uh, just uh, making that up. Uh, in, in, in my view, that shows what you just said that probably we're having a chronic, chronic structural problem and um, things just coming on top of it, like a systemic disease, like an infection or some other systemic disorders, just can push things over the edge um, as, as a lingering. And uh, I wonder whether, you know, like uh, uh, microglia or neuroinflammatory uh, uh, mm, uh, changes that are, uh, uh, um, um, like acting up um, are, are the partners in crime here. Because I want to get back to normal pressure hydrocephalus. So people with normal pressure hydrocephalus that have dementia or walking problem incontinence, if they just have a urinary tract infection or anything going on like the stressors in their life, they get worse from one moment to the other. So these external stressors, stress, stressors um, likely push things and tip them over. And that might as well account for the Chiari and uh, inflammation and neuroinflammation and microglia, these are these little guys in our brain that can, you know, destroy the neurons, are probably the mediator between our body and the nervous system. And I think there's something to, uh, to Chiari there as well. Interesting. Thank you. And let's we'll move on to the next stage. Um, so in the, the next two, two talks, I'm going to kick off, and then Sean Dioni will pick up af after me. And this is now uh, looking at the anatomical evidence for the contribution of cerebellum to, to cognitive function. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll give you, this, uh, give you uh, just a, a, a word or two about my own background, and I'll tell you about Sean, who's going to pick up after me. Sean is an assistant uh, professor of engineering here at Brown University. He trained with some very fine people. He, tra he trained, uh, first he got uh, his uh, PhD uh, from the uh, uh, University of Western Ontario, and then in London he trained with uh, Derek Jones and with Heidi Johansenberg in imaging, and, n and then was a uh, MRC fellow in the neuroimaging uh, at uh, King's College and Institute of Psychiatry. And now he's at Brown University, so you guys are lucky to have him. Uh, and he'll be talking about uh, myelin imaging. Uh, and how it's uh, going to help us understand brain development and, and he'll talk about its implications uh, for cognition in Chiari. So I'll talk for the first half hour and then Sean will pick it up from there. So I want to talk about the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome and it's uh, what the anatomy is of such a, such a story. 
and what its implications could be. Uh, much of this is published, so if, if I run through it a bit fast and you miss some of it, uh, please, for the students, uh, pull up the papers and, and take a look. It's, it's all out there. Uh, I'll be talking about some scales here, so that that's a disclosure. These are licensed to MGH, and some of the books will be published. Uh, just a word on how we got to the point where we were 30 years ago. Uh, Rolando down the bottom had the idea in 1810 that the cerebellum is important for um, movement uh, and, and power, uh, but Florenz, who was a giant in the field in 1824, did his experiments in pigeons uh, to show that the cerebellum was important for motor control and not for power, and his work was uh, sparked off, so we understand from the historians, by, his fact, by the fact that he was incensed by Franz Joseph Gaul, uh, who was a great anatomist uh, and basically initiated the field of behavioral neurology but went a bit off the rails in talking about cerebellum as a seat of sexual proclivity. And this really annoyed Florenz, who went to study cerebellum and showed that it was important uh, not for such things but important for motor control. That was the rule for a long time. Uh, the cerebellar syndrome equaled ataxia, uh, gait imp impairment, uh, the extremity dysmetria, difficulty with coordination of the arms, heel to shin uh, jerkiness, uh, speech Im impairments, articulation troubles, oculomotor abnormalities. And we know this from the work of the great neurologists Sanger Brown, Pierre Marie, Felix Babinski, and Gordon Holmes, all of whom really helped uh, together collectively to define the clinical neurology of cerebellum, but in retrospect, it's a clinical neurology of the motor cerebellum. Um, where I'm going to go with the story is that we now think about the cerebellum as being part of the neural circuitry linked up with the cerebral hemispheres. What we understand about the way the brain works is, at least at the present time, is that rather than uh, everything being an island unto itself, there are distributed neural systems around these different areas in the Broadman map, which is, uh, and Marcel Mestelem uh, 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 colorized according to motor and association and uh, a primary uh, motor, sensory, visual, auditory association and then higher order areas. Uh, and these areas are all characterized by unique architectural air regions talking to each other in a defined manner, working collectively together to support behavior. So the distributed neural circuitry idea is how we now understand nervous system function, each node in the system doing its own thing. The cerebellum is uh, hidden down the bottom of the brain, but when you turn the brain upside down, it's front and center. So that's our focus today. <laughs> and the cerebellum is tied into the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, but I wanna, first I want to just give you a couple words about how it's organized. It's not a black box. The red line here is a primary fissure which separates the anterior lobe from the posterior lobe. And the anterior lobe is much smaller than the posterior lobe, which is huge in the human. And the posterior lobe is what evolved through evolution, both the deep nuclei and the posterior lobe. So there are different lobules you can identify, and this, uh, by placing this in the, in the standard uh, coordinates, which we did now back in, in 1999 and 2000, we can now identify where cerebellum is on imaging studies. So that's the lobules of cerebellum, lobes and lobules. Secondly, the histology of the cerebellum is pretty consistent throughout, and we've known this since Ramon y Cajal. Here's his diagram in, 19, in the 1900s, and he has the more recent version of the uh, cerebellar architecture. So there's a consistency to the cerebellar architecture in the trilaminar cortex, <clears throat> the granular cells, Purkinje cells, and molecular layer, and that repeats throughout the cerebellum with a few variations. There is also an interesting pattern of parasitical zonation in cerebellum, which you can identify with a monoclonal antibody. These are called zebrin stripes, which relate to white matter modules and relate to the architecture of the connections between the, cerebral cor the cerebellar cortex and the deep nuclei, and the deep nuclei, cerebellar cortex, and the inferior olive. So there's a connectivity here that parallels parasitical zones, certainly in the olivary system. The other major point which puts to rest an argument that was going on by Florenz and others in the 1800s is that there, in fact, is topography in cerebellum. This is a motor map of cerebellum with the legs up in the front and the flattened cerebellum. The, the arms further back, head and neck at the posterior vermis, <clears throat> and a secondary representation here in the medial part of the posterior lobe. Um, but interestingly, this motor map, this homunculus, in fact, was a sensory map. So it was a sensory mapping study showing where things are in cerebellum. So it's a sensory motor physiology of cerebellum. But secondly, there's also input from auditory and visual regions into the posterior vermis. And then finally, there's a big nothing out here in the lateral hemisphere. 
And this speaks to the fact that this is a silent region in terms of sensory motor input, like the old-fashioned, remember, the silent frontal lobe. So the bottom line is, not so silent anymore. This is the technique that uh, Deepak Pandya, my mentor and teacher and friend now for three decades, uh, uh, used to uh, study the question of a cerebellum involved in cognition. We looked at the pathways linking cerebellum to the cerebral cortex. You make an injection of a tracer in the brain, you follow it down through the white matter, you see how it jumps over the uh, lateral geniculate and terminates in the brain stem down here. So what you have is injections in the cortex to the pons, termination down here, because from the pons goes into cerebellum, and the feed forward system takes you from cerebellum to thalamus, thalamus back to cortex. So what we showed in a series of studies over the years is that when you make injections in the monkey brain of these tracers in the motor regions or the prefrontal cortex or the posterior parietal regions or the temporal lobe or the periapocampal gyrus, there are projections here to the pons, rostral to caudal, that are organized according to the origin in the cortex. So there are in fact motor projections and sensory projections, but these are more in the monkey to the caudal half of the pons around the, the peduncle fibers coming down into the spinal cord. But there are m large projections from the prefrontal cortex, from the posterior parietal region, from the temporal lobe, from the parapocampal gyrus, all areas concerned with cognition, drive, motivation, visual spatial planning, uh, facial recognition, spatial memory, these are all getting into cerebellum. So the cerebellum has access to all this higher order information through these pathways from the cerebral cortex. And they terminate in very specific, precise ways. So even in the motor regions, so say the, the face supplementary motor area is terminating here in the pons, hand it more lateral, legs even further back. So it's true for the motor system and it's true for the prefrontal cortex, the planning, organizing, executive, uh, attention deficit kind of working memory area. And these regions talk to the pons, which then gets into cerebellum in a mosaic of terminations in the rostral pons, more in the medial region. Now that's in the monkey. It turns out that, as uh, uh, my friend Narendra Ramnani showed some years ago now, that in the monkey down here, it, with using track tracing even back then, the green is the frontal lobe, whoops, um, here in the monkey, and this is moving back into sensory motor region. In the human, the green, which is in the peduncle getting into the pons, is much larger. So the percentage of fibers coming from the cortex down into the pons into cerebellum in the human is much greater from the prefrontal cortex and frontal lobe than from the other areas, speaking to the evolution of the, the, the mosaic pressure, is the terminology, of association areas in the cerebral hemisphere and the cognitive regions of cerebellum that I'll talk about. From the pons, it goes right into cerebellum through the middle cerebellar peduncle, shown here in diffusion imaging and there's this massive input from the pons into cerebellum. The cerebellum gets back to the prefrontal cortex or the parietal lobe of the motor cortex, and it does so through this projection to the thalamus and from thalamus back to cortex. And what Peter Strick did with his colleagues over the years is show made injections in either motor regions or prefrontal regions with retrograde traces going back into cerebellum, showing that the top of the dentate nucleus and the interpositus nucleus project to the motor cortex, but the ventral dentate projects to the prefrontal cortex. So there's a topography of projections back to these motor versus not motor areas of the cerebral hemispheres and further through a combination of anterior grade and retrograde uh, transsynaptic viral tracers we now know that M1, the motor cortex, talks to the cerebellar anterior lobe and a bit of lobule 6 and a second representation lobule 8 whereas area 46 here in the prefrontal cortex is talking to the cerebellum in crust 2 in the lateral part of cerebellum more recently evolved crust to a real dichotomy of anterior and posterior cerebellum. Now we know in the human studies as well, using resting state connectivity, where you're looking at uh, blood oxygen level dependent signal in different parts of the brain, and we see now, this is already going back a few years now, uh, one, one snapshot of the story of these resting state networks. So resting state networks in the cerebral hemisphere are a reflection of the interconnections of the brain from one region to another shown by anatomical track tracing. This is not anatomy, it's functional physiology, but it seems to reflect these kind of anatomical connections. There are motor networks, sensory motor networks in blue. There's a, a dorsal attention network. There's a ventral attention network. There's a frontal parietal network and the default mode network, which is what's very active when you're sitting doing nothing, but you're imagining the past, the present, and the future, and you're creating new stuff in default mode. Look how this maps the cerebellum, just with a single snapshot. 
Here is, as we know from Snyder's work back in the 40s and 50s, this is the motor representations on the anterior lobe and a secondary representation of lobule 8. And we have in the posterior lobe all the other things. So the striking conclusion is that most of the human cerebellum is unrelated to motor control. That's a complete revolutionary paradigm. So for the students, when you hear the lectures and you hear about cerebellum as motor control, you should show your lecturers the papers that try and describe what really is going on. They'll love you for it. <laughs> when you do functional MRI, task-based, and you're lying in the scan and doing stuff, this is a meta-analysis that I did with Catherine Studley, now at the University of Washington. Uh, and, and we see that if you, this is rostral, uh, a, a rostral series and a caudal series, looking at different functions, emotion, working memory, spatial cognition, somatosensory, motor language, and executive function, and we see blobs in different places. So you certainly see motor activation in the anterior lobe and secondary representation level 8, but you see language representation, mostly in the right side of the cerebellum, or emotional modulation laterally, also midline, which we don't show here, spatial cognition, uh, executive function bilaterally, that's in the meta-analysis. If you look at in single individuals, or as we did, a group of subjects, uh, nine subjects, we see that there is the primary and secondary representation of some sensory motor function, but there is visual spatial representation in the left cerebellum talks to right cerebral hemisphere, that there is language representation here in the cerebellum on the right, which talks to cerebral hemisphere on the left, and there is bilateral representation with executive function, planning, organizing, and strategy. So there is a functional topography in the cerebellum for all these different, different attributes. We know also that you can modulate the networks upstairs by stimulation of the cerebellum downstairs. If you use transcranial magnetic stimulation, as Mark Helke did with, uh, in, uh, with our, our work together with Albert Pasquale-Yoni, if you stimulate the cerebellar vermis, you change the dorsal attention network in the cerebral hemisphere. If you stimulate the lateral cerebellum cross one and two, you change the default mode network. Creativity, what you're doing, what your brain's doing when you're doing nothing in particular. And tied on top of that, looking at the different anatomy of the system, if you look at the temporal dynamics of the cerebral networks, as uh, Franek Fosden did uh, with uh, EEG, she showed that when you stimulate the vermis as opposed to the lateral hemisphere, you produce the changes in the networks in the different places, but in the same direction. So you're producing a similar kind of change in different places. It speaks to the duality of the heterogeneity of connections, but the consistency of the function. That's a critical concept here, and I'll come back to that. If you do the very old-fashioned approach of looking at patients who've had stroke, you find that when you have a stroke in the anterior lobe, which is motor representation, you get ataxia. This is an ataxia rating scale on the one side, patient 20, 0 is normal, 20 is, is not, and this is just the one side, so this is actually impaired ataxia, dysmetria of the arm and leg, but when you have a stroke of similar size in the pica territory down here in the posterior lobe where there's no motor representation, the patient is not ataxic. And everybody in neurology or neurosurgery has seen these patients where you wonder if you're in the right room because a patient with a big pica stroke does not have ataxia. Once they've gotten over the nausea, vomiting, and vertigo, they're walking around doing fine, assuming the deep nuclei are preserved. So what's the rest of the brain in the cerebellum doing? This is what's going on here. So we described back in 1998 already, work that began in the, in the early 1990s, and looking at patients with focal lesions to try and understand what is the phenomenology that occurs in the cognitive domain when you have a lesion of cerebellum. So this is the patient who taught me the way to go, and the reason I have uh, confidence in showing you those first two cases up front is because these patients show you the answer, we have to figure out the question. That's the rule. Patients tell you the answer, we got to find the questions. So here's the answer from the patient I saw back in 1990. She has a midline tumor taken up by Bob Ogem, and here she's standing heel to toe, doing fine from the motor perspective, but she has a behavioral change. Uh, her behavioral change is one that the nurses pick up and call to our attention because she's not behaving like herself. She's whining in the, in the, uh, in the room, she's being disrespectful to her parents, she's being childlike speaking in a high pitched whiny voice, she's uh, disrobing in the corridor. This is not the girl that they met beforehand. And at the bedside, she has trouble bisecting a line, she has trouble drawing a clock, she perseverates, she has a problem with writing a sentence called agrammatism. 
So in the same, in, in one patient, we're seeing a problem with executive function, visual spatial cognition, language processing, and affective regulation. And we then go on to study a series of patients, mostly with stroke, who have, just by bedside testing, uh, a score that we devised to look at executive function, reasoning, calculation, and affect all impaired in this, in this group. Some problem with visual spatial function, verbal memory, and language, and relatively less in problems with uh, visual memory, ar arousal, recall, uh, and praxis. And Janet Sherman took these folks into the lab and showed that uh, if you look at a z-score distribution where zero is, is the mean, up, uh, the standard deviation is above or below the mean, the executive function is impaired in this group, pushed to the left, and particularly so in people who have lesions of the posterior lobe, those with lesions of the anterior lobe were relatively spared. So that's the difference between those who are fine and those who are not. The FAS is a phonemic fluency task, I'll come back to that later. The verbal visual memory is pushed off to the left. Visual spatial function is terrible in trying to draw the ray figure. And as a group, intellectual function is pushed off to the left. So this is the basis of what we call the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome, which uh, Manto and Marion identified as a third cornerstone of clinical ataxiology, the one being motor control, the second being vestibular, and the third being the cognitive. And it's characterized by impairments of executive function, visual spatial cognition, language deficits, and personality change. So set shifting, verbal fluency, working memory. These folks have trouble doing multitasking. Doing more than one thing at a time is a, is a, is a disaster. A spatial organization and memory as a, as a way to get into sort of gestalt big picture thinking. A grammatism, a prosodia, a difficult flattening of the, uh, of the, of the uh, output, a difficulty finding the right way to express ourselves uh, grammatically, and finding words to, to uh, describe things are consistently seen. And change in affect, disinhibition, and inappropriate behavior uh, little did I realize how uh, marked this would be uh, as we evolved, and this, I think, gets exactly what we were describing in the, in the patients uh, uh, in, in the first hour. Uh, we know now, this is work that just came out uh, last year, uh, if you look at strokes in a more sophisticated manner using voxel-based morphometry, you find that the cerebellar motor syndrome occurs, again, from the anterior lobe, and when it gets lobules 3, 4, and 5 up here, uh, the cognitive affective syndrome uh, when only uh, occurs when you get patients who have stroke in the cerebellar posterior lobe. If you have a bit of both, you're crossing boundaries. So there's a very clear differentiation. And within here, I won't bore you with it, but in the paper, in the image of the clinical, you see the different aspects of cognition that tie into different parts of the cerebellum. The same is true for children. The surgeons will know this. Uh, you take out the, the cerebellar tumors and you have issues with cognition. He has an impairment of copy, recall, and delayed recall, which for the world looks like fragmentation or dissociation, as you would see in a psychiatric terminology. And in kids, the problems uh, that we see are difficulty organizing verbal or spatial material, planning and organization, expressive language, memory for stories, they're better when you have to give them clues. And the major issue is this regulation of, the, of affect from vermis lesions, irritability, impulsivity, disinhibition, and labile affect, all of which you heard about in the Chiari cases. And we now know that the cerebellar mutism syndrome, which we talked about in the, in the Iceland uh, Delphi group a couple of years ago, published last year, describes a CMS, which is which the uh, surgeons all see, essentially as a maximally severe cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. The term posterior fossa syndrome, which I coined as a bad one when we're trying to throw it out, uh, because it's not just posterior fossa, there's a specific pathology behind that. Buccofacial apraxia, apraxia of speech, emotional dysmetria, uh, with lesions in the brainstem causing other problems, ataxia, long track signs, cranial neuropathies, but the behavioral issues are from the cerebellum. Cerebellar regenesis is a maximal disorder where there's no cerebellum. These kids are born like that. They have some mild problems with motor difficulty. I won't go into that in detail. Surprisingly looking pretty good. They have a characteristic childish-like speech. But when you do their cognitive testing, he has our z-score graph again, he has zero. These are all way below the mean, including the uh, intellectual function, uh, visual spatial processing, and executive function. So just a couple of slides on the relevance to other disorders. Children born very preterm will have isolated cerebellar hemorrhage uh, or cerebellar infarction, as Kathy Limperopoulos has shown now in a series of studies over 10 years. They do have neurological difficulties in terms of motor control, but there is a major behavioral issue here uh, with language, expressive and receptive, behavioral impairments, and autism scores in almost a half of these kids, in whom the pathology is cerebellum. 
you need the cerebellum for sustaining projections to the cerebral cortex, and this, in a sense, is a developmental cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. You see it in the degenerative diseases. There are no ataxias now in which cognition is entirely spared. Those in which the cerebellum is relatively purely involved tend to have executive deficits uh, as, the, as the core, but other problems are, about, are abound as well, depending on the nature of the disorder. I will make it clear, though, that there's a limit to how far this goes. And once patients have declarative memory impairment, a true amnestic dementia, now you're upstairs, because amnestic dementias are not cerebellum. Uh, Xavier looked at language in these folks with cerebellar impairments and showed that whereas they do well with a structured language task, when you have a free-ranging task, they have what's called metalinguistic impairments. The way that you use language to express thought, it becomes a dysmetria of thought in language. Ambiguity, not entirely clear what you mean. Uh, visiting relatives can be a nuisance. Uh, it can go both ways. There's a bit of ambiguity there. Uh, inference. Uh, you know, they were going to have a picnic outside, but they ended up having it in the living room instead. Why? Well, you know, this was yesterday, it was a torrential downpour. A metaphor. You can see through him. You can't really see through him. There's a metaphor there. You know, expressing thoughts in a grammatically and contextually appropriate way. How do you get things out? How do you express yourself in a way that you say what you mean, and others understand what it is you're trying to say? And this is all impaired in people who have cerebellar injury, even though there's no aphasia like Wernicke's and Broca's. And the theory of mind is, is affected as well. It's, it's tough for all of us. And, and, you know, I certainly have my chat. I'm just trying to figure out what somebody else may be thinking or feeling, and maybe men are worse than women, I don't know, but it's tough at the best of times. These folks have even more trouble. When you do standardized theory of mind tasks, understanding, generating, regulating social behavior, patients who have cerebellar injury have difficulty with that. And that seems to point also midline in terms of limbic behaviors and the hemispheres for cognition. There are a variety of behaviorally defined disorders in which cerebellum has been implicated. This goes back a long time now. So going back, this is 20 plus years. Attention deficit disorder, dyslexia, the infants born very preterm, schizophrenia, and there's a recent study on a GWAS in, in schizophrenia showing cerebellum is consistently implicated. Autism was early to the game. In fact, Tom Kemper and Margaret Bowman showed at Boston City Hospital. Tom Kemper was my teacher in neuropathology and neuroanatomy early on before Dr. Pandya. Showed that in autism, the midline nuclei and the controls are disintegrated in the autistic brain. Along at, around the time that uh, Crochet was showing that there's cerebellum change on morphology on MRI. So these are consistently linked uh, to, uh, to cerebellum. And then we talked about 10 years ago now, uh, the neuropsychiatry of the cerebellum. Again, listening to patients and then drawing insights from patients. So listening to patients is great, but then you have to do something with it. So you have the, uh, you, you, get the, you get the answers, but then you have to analyze, put it together, synthesize, and come up with the questions to explain that. So that's the key, word. that's what I'll leave the students with. In the neuropsychiatry of the cerebellum, we divide it into these five domains of behavior, each with an overshoot and an undershoot component. An attentional control, emotional control, autism spectrum, psychosis spectrum, and social skill set. And each of those has an overshoot and an undershoot, or hypometria, hypometria, in the realm of cerebellar disorder. So what I'm going to do is leave you with the theory that ties together the anatomy and this uh, rapid run through of some of the essence of the clinical neurology. Uh, and it goes as follows. So the dysmetria of thought theory is one that, that helps us to think this through and, and as a game changer in recontextualizing cerebellum on the one hand, but it actually extends to the rest of the brain on the other, because if it's true for cerebellum, the same kind of concept has to be true for the rest of the brain. So the idea is that the cerebellum regulates rate, rhythm, and force. We know that, going back to you know, uh, the, the giants in the last in the, in the end of the 1800s, rate, rhythm, and force. But it does the same thing to mental processes. So here, it's, it's the speed, the consistency, the capacity, and the appropriateness of mental or cognitive processes. That's the idea. And dysmetria is, is, the dysmetria of movement is matched by the unpredictability and the logic with social and societal interaction. You don't lose power, you just, your control is off. It's like the spring is too loose. You're overshooting, undershooting. And you can't check the parameters of movement, you can't quite check the parameters of behavior, perception of reality, trying to match output with input, your behavior appropriate to context. 
Because, and now we go back to the beginning of this talk, because the cerebellar cortex is anatomically homogeneous, but the anatomy ties it into different regions, the cerebellum becomes a node in the distributed neural circuits for sensory motor, autonomic, cognitive, limbic, but it's doing the same thing to those behaviors. So the topography matters. There's an anterior, an anterior lobe and a, and a lobule 8 which are sensory motor and, and vestibular cerebellum and, and 9 and 10, uh, and cognitive and affective which is mostly in the lateral hemisphere as lobule 6 and 7. But we're learning from imaging that something's going on down here. And this is going to be really important in Chiari. So that's just a teaser because we're going to get to that. That there's something happening in lobule 9 that we now know, and lobule 10, that we now know from imaging, resting state imaging, and some task imaging, that it seems to be tied into the default mode network and the salience network. So it seems like there's more going on here than just uh, vestibular. And then one other thing is the vestigial nucleus, the midline nucleus, is the uh, nucleus of the limbic circuitry in cerebellum, the vermis, because that's the vermis part. The vermis and the physical nucleus, autonomic regulation, affect, and emotionally important memory, but it also does, truly, eye movements, equilibrium, and gait. And a poster at the Society of Research in Cerebellum in Ataxia just a month or two ago shows that the outputs from the vestigial nucleus are anatomically organized according to different parts of the neurons in the vestigial, which provides exactly the kind of precision of anatomy of this nucleus linking up with different functions, limbic, autonomic, eye movement, and balance. The lateral hemispheres are important for executive function, visual, spatial, language, learning, and so on. And the universal cerebellar transform is the notion that the cerebellum looks the same and it does the same thing everywhere. It optimizes performance, we think, by modulating behavior around a homeostatic baseline, implicitly without a conscious awareness, according to context. That's, that's the theory. Others have different views about that. That's how we come at this. That's what the UCT is, the universal transform. And when it breaks down, it breaks down the same way that's inherent in the theory. So the cerebellar motor system damage produces dysmetria of movement. That's the cerebellar motor syndrome and the damage to the cerebellar cognitive or limbic regions produces dysmetria of thought and emotion, and that's a cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. So finally then, implications are as follows. That when there's a, an overt cerebellar injury, there's a critical issue that we heard about right off the bat this morning. It's the need to know imperative. Patients need to know. It's not in their head, it's in their brain. And they want a diagnosis. They can't just go hand wavy, I'm not sure what this is. So that no, the knowledge of what somebody has, either the patient or the family, is a critical driver of how we can be better doctors. Recognition leads to intervention, whatever the intervention would be, and allows cross-modal interve intervention uh, or cognitive rehabilitation therapies. The second side of this is that disorders that are primarily neuropsychiatric, like the patients I present, or who have behavioral neurology disorders, may have cerebellum at their base in terms of the pathophysiology. Because cerebellum is no longer just a motor control problem. It's a coordination problem of memory, of, of language, of thinking, of emotional processing. And again here, there are novel strategies for treatment in psychiatric illness. And the Chiari malformation actually resides, I think, exactly at the intersection of these two approaches. Because now you have something going on down there in cerebellum morphology. And you have a neuropsychiatry, cognitive neurology and perhaps there's an opportunity for us to use Chiari, but to make patient, patients better and to understand the nervous system better to further our science and to further the, the uh, advancement of, of, of our mission. All this work is done in collaboration. Uh, I've mentioned Dr. Pandya, uh, met Janet Sherman, Xavier McGuell, um, and a bunch of folks who, who make all this work uh, possible. So I'll end with, end with that and uh, just take a question or two if you have a minute. Thank you. So that's a mouthful. This stuff is all in the literature. Please take a look. All right, let's, let's go find it and look it up. Yes, Petra. I have one question. Yeah. First of all, thank you. Anytime I listen to you, I, uh, I'm impressed and think that the cerebellum is so precious and the most beautiful organ, and I don't even want to touch it anymore <laughs> and don't want to harm it, uh, speaking as a neurosurgeon. Um, uh, but um, uh, I always think of the cerebellum when I, and of you when I see it. Uh, 
Um, but um, I might get myself into trouble, but I'm not a computer scientist, but um, thinking of like computers, could one say that, because you described the connections, uh, that maybe the cerebellum is like a, like a backup system to increase the working capacity of the computer or the, you know, like a memory backup system where like complex tasks are um, there and you can take them out when needed to work faster kind of thing? No, I think that's, I think that's, that's inherent in, in what it does. I agree with that completely. So the uh, implicit memory or procedural learning you need that, you need to be able to do stuff automatically so when you drive your car you don't have to be thinking about where your foot is on the pedal or when you're walking you don't have to think about where your feet are going or when you're interacting with society you don't have to keep saying to yourself and oh, no, I must be nice to this person because I mean you, you can take it across many levels but that kind of uh, implicit awareness of how to be in the world I think you, you need a system for that and, and that's a, that, that gets delegated downstairs. <laughs> Uh, into subcortical systems. Certainly the, the striatum has a role in that and cerebellum has a role in that. So I think that's part and parcel of what's going on. I think that's exactly right. Martin. Fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, we've been excited in the last decade to learn about the plasticity uh, after injury to areas of the cortex. Not all areas, but some areas of the cortex and rewiring, if you will, malfunctioning uh, and, and circuitry after injury. What is your feeling about the possibility of that happening in the cerebellum parts of parts of these areas or something? Do you think that there's when, when a neurosurgeon takes off the lateral portion of, of, of the cerebellum, might there be some new circuitry which, which happens afterwards? I think there's no reason to believe the cerebellum shouldn't be any different than the rest of the of the brain, and that uh, injury leads to reorganization. Exactly how that reorganization takes place, how far it goes, how much it can do in terms of functional recovery, those are all open questions. But I think absolutely think there's, there's plasticity. Where I would uh, use that question to, draw, to emphasize one, one point is I think that in the old days, and we know in the old days, if someone didn't have a motor impairment from a pica stroke, what was the reason given? Plasticity. <laughs> It made up for it. It was redundant. And that's the wrong answer. What we now know is that you don't have a motor impairment from a pica injury because there's no motor representation there. So that's, that's to differentiate an inaccurate answer from a spot-on question, which is what you're asking. Is, is, is that plasticity? Uh, there has to be. There's no reason why it shouldn't be as the rest of the brain. How, does, how is it organized or how, how does it uh, manifest? I think those are things we will have need to discover as time goes by. Do one more, yes, sir. Yes, I, I, I learned an awful lot from you today, thank you. And I was suddenly at a, at a stopping point when you said that you uniquely amnestic dementia has to be supertentorial. Um, I'm not familiar with that term. And what what makes it that it has to be from the, from the uh, anterior portion of the brain? So the cerebellum is important for working memory, for finding words, for organizing strategies to retrieve information that you have. But once you've actually lost the information, you no longer remember either that a watch is called a watch, or that you have a watch, uh, or what the name of your loved one is. Those, or those deficits do not come from cerebellar damage. And they come from the memory systems upstairs, hippocampal formation, enteronal cortex, the subcortical areas involved in, in, in learning and memory. Cerebellum is tied into hippocampus, and it had, there's a role in that, in retrieving information and keeping things online and finding organ ways to organize and strategize. But I think what, we, what we're becoming clearer on in terms of the boundaries of how far this goes from cerebellar cognition is that once you've actually lost information, just not there, not tip of the time phenomenon where it can come out somehow, but the information's gone, but actually storage of information long term in the declarative sense, that's, that's a, a cerebral hemisphere problem. Quick follow-up question. So what is the specific test for that difference? So I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. Okay. Um, but the, the one liner is, can you give me the words to learn, can you get them back in any way, spontaneously, with a clue, with multiple choice? So you can test that.